Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Too Many Hobbies Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Althorpe. Today we've got my buddy John Wallace with me from Wild Game Cook. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, looking forward to being on today. Yeah, so John's background is uh, he worked for Delta Waterfowl for a while. Um, that's when you made the leap from Delta Waterfowl to Wild Game Cook full time. What did you do before that? Uh, I worked for Pheasants Forever for about 12 years in a couple of different capacities, mostly fundraising. Um, I was a biologist for a few years. I have a fish and wildlife degree as my background. Nice. Okay. So this is definitely not a stranger to you. <laughs> no, for sure. Just love to cook and I love more so to eat good food. So did the cooking portion happen when you were with Pheasants Forever? Is that what kind of sparked the interest or was it before that? Uh, it was definitely before that. Um, it was really in college. Um you go to college and everyone knows you eat ramen and macaroni and cheese and so on. Well, at our house or in our dorm, we ate hamburger helper, deer helper. We ate it all <laughs> the time. And uh, it was good, but it get, got old quick. Um, so I just started experimenting uh, mostly with this chicken pasta dish that we still make today. Um, I call it, we have a fast version, which is using breaded chicken patties. And then we have a Sunday dinner version, which is fresh chicken, sauteed veggies and such. Um, but I just learned to cook that recipe over time, and that led into a passion for cooking. Um, so that had been in the early to mid-2000s, and then got married, and, you know, yeah, just uh, learned to cook watching Food Network and Cooking Channel, and now it's Netflix and YouTube. Uh, but, yeah, just honed it in over the years. So then being an Ohio native, um, have you lived in Ohio your whole life? Um, most of my life. I did spend 2013 to 2019 in Missouri. Okay. Uh, my job, Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever, took me out there. Um, it was phenomenal. The people were great. The hunting and fishing was amazing. The mushroom hunting was better than it is over here in Ohio. Um, but yeah, then we moved back home in 2019. Okay. So when you started in Ohio with your hunting and fishing, did you start deer hunting or did you start with a waterfowl or squirrel or where did you start? Great question. So I started hunting around the age of 12, 13, and it was squirrel hunting with my 10, 22. Okay. Um, and then it was a couple of years later, I think I was 14 and I uh, went down to Southeastern Ohio with my uncles and, uh, started deer hunting and I was lucky enough to get a deer, I think my second season. So I was about 15 years old and then, um, got into dove shooting, wing shooting and around, uh, the mid two thousands when I started volunteering for the divisional wildlife and got into waterfowl hunting a few years after that. So I guess I was probably in my mid twenties, uh, when I started waterfowl hunting. And now with three kids, uh, one's soon to be 15, one's 13, and one's just turned 10, um, we do everything a little bit. We do a lot of small game hunting. We do upland hunting, do deer hunting. Uh, we're starting to get into a little bit of predator hunting, a little coyote hunting, uh, nothing too major. But, yeah, we're not too dedicated at one thing. Is Assuming that we can fill the freezer, then it opens up uh, the doors to get out and chase ducks or pheasants or whatever it may be. Yeah, and I'm sure that... You're hunting now, since it's more focused on the kids, um, does that leave you with a lot of time for scouting, or do you take them with you and start to teach them that way? Uh, great question. So I've never really been much of a scouter. Um, I've kind of been one to complain after a skunker hunt, you know? <laughs> uh, it's like, you do sports really hard, so I have two boys that do three sports a year. Um, my daughter does two, soon to be three. So, you know, we're, we're doing something with sports almost every day of the week. So we try to slide in any hunting we can, when we can. Um, and we're pretty blessed, especially on the deer hunting side of things where we hunt here in Ohio and where we hunt in Missouri. Um, it's, it's pretty prolific as far as the does go, you know, like we're a big meat family. So big, big does walk out. I don't know that there, I can count on one hand the amount of times that they've got a free pass. <laughs> If I see a big doe come out, that's what I'm taking too. I don't really pass up. I'm not. I'm yeah. not big on like the the antler, you know, big game, you know, bit trophy hunting essentially. Like I really, if I'm going deer hunting, it's just to shoot a deer. I don't really care right. how, how what if it's a buck, if it's a doe. Yeah, it's it makes makes hunting a little bit more enjoyable for me when it's something comes out. I can just feel free to shoot it. You know. For sure. I mean, I got my, that's my biggest deer back there. I think it's sub 130. It's not, but it, it was the biggest for me and it, it took me 25 years to shoot that. So it's it, my only shoulder mount that I've got. It's nice. And I've hunted for like 25 years and I've killed four antler deer. 
Okay. Uh, three, which I knew were bucks. The one was a small little five pointer that I had to tag um, back in like the mid two thousands when that extra weekend first came around. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I'm telling you, I probably could kill some some bucks if uh, I didn't shoot the first big doe that walked out. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's part of who we are. Like we we eat wild game number one in our house. So uh, we haven't bought beef in probably fifteen years. Jeez, well, that's nice. Yeah. So I know that you're you're big on raising the next generation of hunters especially within your own family. When did you start to actually compile a plan to start introducing them to the outdoors? Like what age were they that you started kind of looking at it? Yeah, great question. So um, I really didn't have a plan. It just came together as they they got older. But, um, you know, I'm writing a story right now on kind of how to raise, you know, your next lifelong hunting buddy so that they've got a strong foundation. They love to be out there rather than being forced to go. Uh, but it starts with when they're really little, just taking pictures with them when you've got your, you know, your deer, your ducks, whatever it may be, um, you know, taking them outside and just, uh, being around, just being around the culture of it, cleaning guns, et cetera. Uh, but when they were four years old is when I decided that they weren't as fragile. They were probably out of diapers, you know, uh, you can come out and sit on the dove bucket. You can come out, follow me around the squirrel woods and, um, Generally, so I'm still trying to kill deer to feed the family, so I didn't need any four-year-olds out in the blind with me. So when they were, I just made this up kind of on the fly, but I articulated to them like, hey, this is the plan. When you're six, you can come out with me deer hunting, you know? Um, so they'd come out with me deer hunting at six. And then when they were eight is when they could start carrying a shotgun and squirrel hunting and small game hunting. Um, and then when they were 10 is when they could start deer hunting. I'm a big believer in you've got to earn your right to kill deer and or turkey. Turkey's a big deal, but deer specifically... You know, there's some laws in states like in Missouri, for example, you could be six years old and legally kill a deer or turkey. And I just don't think six year olds have the mental capacity to really truly understand what they're doing. Right. Uh, and to appreciate it and and so on. So they're going to be just as tickled to kill their first squirrel, you know, as they right. are going to be deer later. So why not have six great moments of killing your first squirrel, rabbit, dove? etc and then your first deer rather than just having that big moment of your first deer right maybe it won't be a letdown kill your first squirrel but it's like build up to that um so my daughter just turned um 10 but she her first year hunting was this last year she was a little too small to carry a shotgun at, at age eight so this fall she uh came out with us carrying a shotgun had some success and she's all in she was wearing camo this morning on the uh on the way to school which is sweet yeah that's super cool i asked because you know i have two two kids that are under three and it starts to, you know, as you're, if you're an outdoorsman and you're starting to like actually start thinking about when you want to take them out, it's nice that you sent me over the story to review and wasn't sure if you wanted to talk about it or not. So I'm glad that you brought it up, but it's a, it's a great foundation just to hear somebody's point of view and then see the successes that they've had. If anybody follows you, they can see it because you post it and it's a, uh, it's cool to see another dad or another parent that's trying to build a foundation not just for their own kids but then share that information with others so that they can kind of take if not the same path something similar and come up with a plan to actually introduce it to them correctly instead of like they're three years old and you take them out and they get bored and they never want to go again sure or get cold you know i remember my dog yeah. those first couple hunts um, you really got to pick your days. You know, you don't want to pick a really dreary, cold, miserable day because that's going to leave an imprint on them. Right. You know, you've probably seen the movie. I think it's uh, it's not Wreck It Ralph, but one of those movies. It's uh, they got those core memories. You know. Yeah. And they don't want to. They don't remember the one where they nearly got frostbite on their toes or their hands. So right. you know, pick pick a 50, 60 degree day when you go out squirrel hunting, and um, yeah, they're they're all in. I love it. Uh, my daughter. It's funny. She's been my shadow for like the last three months. My wife's not really been a fan of it. Um, but yeah, she, she's really digging it. Uh, she's really excited to get after deer and turkey this year. Uh, she gets kind of an expedited process because the boys had to hunt for like three seasons. You know, that eight-year-old season, nine, the fall of they were 10, and then they could deer hunt. Whereas she just started hunting, and she's going to be turkey hunting theoretically this spring, assuming you yeah. can handle the shotgun, which I've got. Uh, a new Mossberg Bantam coming, so nice. Uh, sh should be good. Now that's really cool. I think it's uh, it's important what you're doing, 
because you can share that information and start getting another generation of hunters interested. And it's, you know, that's the future of what we're doing here. And I think that it's something that's applaudable that, that you've taken the initiative to start coming up with that information, that content to be able to share with these, you know, up and coming parents or, you know, people who are starting to think about it, you know, trying to introduce kids at a young age, it can be tricky. It's kind of like introducing a dog, you know, if you introduce them too early, they can start to develop bad habits. And unfortunately, fortunately, kids are pretty similar to puppies. <laughs> oh, no question. And uh, the, the conversation, um, I've been at this a, a while. I mean, again, my oldest is 15 and really I built the template around him if you will, I kind of won it. And then of course, but it was in place then for the second and third child. Right. And one of my good buddies out in Missouri, he's like, man, I'd really love for my daughter to be my good old hunting buddy. You know, I'm like, well, it's not just going to happen. Like you're going to have to change your mindset. You're going to have to go out at different times of the day, make the, the hunt shorter. And you're going to have to sacrifice your time in order to benefit the child. And right. that's a tough, that's a tough thing to grasp if you've been set in your ways for a while. Um, and again, two things. One, my, template is just simply that it's a template to give you a, a general concept of a, a structure to to do it through right the, the right. numbers can change the ages can change but the other thing i look forward to as well it you know this is going to be some time down the road but again i didn't really have a template i just kind of built it but it'd be it's going to be cool to see hopefully if my kids when they have kids kind of implement the same structure right if they believe in it and it worked out well for them hopefully they see that and kind of raise their kids through that same structure uh, because nowadays, you know, the biggest competition to getting outdoors is electronics, right? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Well, in our household, as I mentioned in the story, we really limited electronics from them. They didn't really have a tablet to speak of. It wasn't until they started getting into school that some of the schools provide those, but right. um, that's a big deal for us. And it builds a foundation of knowing who you are outdoors rather than trying to take someone who's been indoors for four, five, six, seven years right. and try to get them to flip that switch, it, that's going to be a hard mountain to climb. Yeah, and I think that, you know, society in general, it's going to be hard to to break that just because it's so device and internet and social media driven. You know, it's it's tough. I think it's going to be, it's going to be tough for me. I already know it's going to be, you know, but yeah. it's nice to have something some sort of information to refer to and like kind of bring my like you said bring my mindset back kind of ground it to where i how i want these kids to to be introduced to the outdoors yeah as you said it's going to be hard but it can be done you just got to be purposeful with it and stand uh <laughs> you just got to be purposeful and stand on principles and um you know it, it can totally be done yeah no i i appreciate you uh you sharing that and uh yeah it's been it was cool to read through it it was really cool to see that that's something that that you put forward and i already knew just based on this like i said the stuff that you post online you always have your kids with you and i think that that's that's really cool to see but we can switch over then to the wild game cook side so if anybody follows you they see that you've uh you your content's been shared with midway usa remington um, I know you got some other things in the works, but from your time with uh, Pheasants Forever, with Delta, as you started to build your relationships, what kind of gave you the push to go full time with your Wild Game Cook brand? Yeah, great question. So I think it really comes down to authenticity. Um, so I've had the Wild Game Cook brand for a little over 10 years now. And I can proudly say it, it's generally had the same vibe, the same feeling, and the same partners um, from the beginning. Um, I, obviously, I've added new partners, but it's been the same partners the whole time. Um, it's who I am. You know, I'm not um, out there just kind of making content for the sake of making content. Right. Um, I generally try to either inspire with my post, just maybe it's just a type of a food I made, um, or it's some sort of tip or trick but I try to post with substance rather than just post content. And I think that's really worked out well. Um, that's allowed partners to more so come to me or, or find me, which has uh, been nice. Um, and yeah, they, they want that field to table uh, full circle um, content. And uh, I was turning a lot of it away because I had a full-time job and I always have a full-time family. 
I mean, my family uh, obligations are crazy. Like, so we have sports almost every night of the week, and then we're trying to hunt. And so there's very little time. Um, but basically, yeah, uh, Midway USA reached out to me and wanted some uh, content for their website. And uh, kind of gave me the courage to say, hey, if I kind of work through this and, and piece together some of my other relationships, I think we can make make this happen full time. So it's been a, a six or seven month uh, journey here, a little bit experiment. But my website, wildgamecook.com, is now live. Um and yeah, the content is mostly up on Midway USA's website. You can go to my recipes page and, and find that link for a bunch of great videos and uh, waterfowl recipes, deer recipes, things like that. So I'm uh, still putting it together, uh, but 2024 should be a good year. I'm doing also in-person events, so cooking demonstrations, cooking classes, deer breakdowns, you know, processing clinics, things of that nature, whether it be for families, whether it be for hunting groups like hunting buddies, camps. Um, or be for corporations, you know, kind of team building events. So is all, all of that information is on your website as well? Yeah, most of it. Uh, some of it's going to be coming on a little bit later um, as far as like uh, how to get in touch with me in regards to different events. But really, if, if you're interested at all, uh, just go to the contact page and shoot me a note. Perfect. We'll put that in the description. So anybody that's interested in that can click on it and find you. But it's, you, know, you just touched on it a little bit. But so I wanted to to really get into the weeds on, you know, processing game, um, making sure that you're getting as much of the, the meat out as possible on different species. You know, I think that the biggest thing that a lot of us as outdoors men and outdoors women start to look at when we're, you know, from wa waterfowl hunting, for example, everybody knows to breast out a duck, but there's so many other par pieces of that duck that you can use. Same with deer, same with squirrels. As far as like small game goes, what are your best tips and tricks for breaking down like squirrels, uh, pheasants, ducks, geese, and then we can we can jump over to big game after that. Sure. So yeah, most certainly I try to focus on keeping the legs, um, whether that be from waterfowl or turkeys, wild turkeys. There's about three pounds of meat on those two legs combined, and there's no doubt that it's harder to cook those than it is a turkey breast or it's harder to cook pheasant legs than it is a pheasant breast. Right. Uh, but nonetheless, if uh, you you take those, and I'm, I'm typically in our house, we don't generally have a pile of birds, whether that's pheasants, whether that's ducks, geese. We have one or two. Maybe if we're lucky, we have five ducks. Um, but, you know, I realize for some people, when they're killing an absorbent amount of waterfowl a year, it can be tedious to keep the legs of all those birds. Right. Um, I would just encourage you to, to keep more than you have been, you know? Um, and they do taste great. They do have a different taste. They do, it's a different muscle structure. Um, but generally it just takes a few more minutes to get in there and hack those legs out. And it doesn't have to be a pretty process. Like I'm not the best field dresser or cleaner in the world, but I get in there and I push it out and I'm cutting the, the feathers off and I pop those legs out and I set them aside and I'm going to freeze those until I have enough to make a meal. Um, and with the legs, whether that's pheasants, ducks, geese, turkeys, it's generally a slow braise. So a braise is just cooking it in a little bit of liquid. Uh, generally, it's covered. Um, and you're going to put it in your smoker or in your oven at a low temperature, like 225, for a few hours, maybe even longer on like turkey legs and stuff until it just becomes tender. That applies for squirrels and uh, rabbits. You could fry those as well. Um, it, it's just a more delicate process and you have a chance to overcook it. Um, so generally for those small game species, other than the breast meat, I'm doing a low and slow application. Um, also all the birds that we harvest in our house, turkeys, waterfowl, upland, we are eating the hearts and livers as well. Um, right. again, I, if I got into a bunch of birds at once, I very well may keep the gizzards, uh, especially a bunch of geese. Um, the goose gizzard is really big, or if we get into a good coot shoot, which has been a while before I've gotten into one of those, they have massively large gizzards for their size. Um, if I got a bunch of them, I'll process them and put them aside because they can be good, but it does take time, right, to pressure cook those and get them tender. Uh, but generally, the hearts and the livers get kind of purged out, let the, the water do its magic, and then we just simply dry those and, and fry them, and it's a household favorite for sure. So when you're done with the, the breakdown of that, are you putting them in a brine for any sort of time to like you said let the water work its magic and if you are like what's that process look like great question so for squirrels and rabbits i'm generally not brining those um again they're getting a slow brace i'm not worried about it um for pheasants 
we go to game preserve from time to time. So chuckers, um, maybe even quail. They're they're pretty delicate and tender, so you don't have to do too much to those. But for pheasants, let's say um, high mountain jerky makes a brine called upland and uh, game bird and poultry brine is what okay. it's called, um, and it's a really good brine. Um, it, it tells you how to do it on the package. Um, it's basically like two teaspoons per quart of water. And it makes your waterfowl and your birds, your upland birds, taste amazing. Uh, makes them also really juicy to where it gives you more room for air not to overcook them. Got it. Okay. Um, but one of the main things that I do is, again, I don't use salt water to, like, clean them or cleanse them after, say, a waterfowl hunt or an upland hunt. I just use regular water if I feel I need to, if they're very bloody. If I can process a bunch of pheasants and they're not really shot up, I'm not really putting them in water. But generally what I will do is I may put them in a Tupperware in the fridge and put just a layer of paper towels at the bottom okay, and let it just kind of absorb some of that liquid. Um, I may leave it uncovered so it gets a little dry and tacky, and that's going to help me back seal it a little better. Um, Got it. I'm definitely a back seal person over butcher paper. You really don't want to go the Ziploc bag route because there's just going to be too much air in there, um, and it's going to it's going to ruin your meat in a, in a few short weeks to a month or two. Um but that paper towel trick and letting it drain is a huge deal. And, this, and more so with waterfowl, it seems like we shoot those up more. Um, and there's more blood in and throughout there, say, than a pheasant breast of sorts. Uh, there's just more damage with the twos and the fours. Um, I generally will get put them in a bowl of water, uh, kind of let it rinse out, you know, let it flow over the top. And I'll just like either set it in the sink, depending on how long I'm going to set it there. I'll put it in the fridge and I'll replace the water as needed until it starts to just be a little bit more clear. Um, and then I'll go to that paper towel route, right? And then if I need to, if I want to, to, to further dry age it in the fridge, I'll put it on a drying rack on a cookie sheet and just allow that air to get to it. Okay. And you could do that for like upwards of a week. So like let it be in water for a day or two and then let it be in paper towels for a day or two. Um, again, I'm busy, so I'll get to it when I get to it. It's not going to go bad, you yeah. know? And then, you know, to put it on a drying rack for, you know, three days, it's going to taste so much better. I like these words, steaky. A goose breast is going to taste more steaky. Uh, a wood duck breast, which is generally a really good eating, it's going to be that much more better eating if you allow it to just hang out for a few days. You can even let it hang out in the fridge as a whole carcass. Uh, leave the back down so the breast meat is facing up so everything's not flowing to the breast meat. Got it. Uh, but you can leave it in the fridge for a day or two like that. You know, put it in the back of your fridge where it's a little colder. Um you know, I guess don't be in a huge rush. Um, if you have the time, don't be in a huge rush to process it and eat it right away or to process it, put it in the freezer. If you can give it some time to, I'm not really good at articulating the science behind all of it. I just know that over time, I've realized that if you can, and I don't even know if dry age is even the appropriate term, but just let it hang out in the fridge for a few days. It's going to taste a lot better. I was just going to ask if it was considered dry aging, what you're, what you're explaining, because yeah, I, a lot of people use that term. If you look on Facebook groups, people tell you, let it dry age from anywhere from three days to three weeks, and then you clean it. And it's like you said, it would give it more like a, of a steak taste. Um, so that's interesting to hear because there's a lot of people that think have this, especially like people that don't know much about waterfowl. Like my wife, if I bring in goose meat and I put it in the sink for like four hours with water, she's like, isn't that going to go bad? And it's like, no, it's really, you know, it's, I, I, I don't want to say I've developed a process over time, but like, I know what works and I'm not anywhere on your level, which is why you're here. But it's more of like, you know, I think that people don't have the, either the, they don't have the information. So it's nice to get somebody like you who can explain that process. And, you know, if you're already doing it, then it's just a, you know, it's a confirmation of valid, you know, it's validating what you're doing, but also get like some more information on what you could do. Sure. And again, this is a disclaimer. I'm a fish and wildlife major. Like I haven't had a degree in any of this. It's all by trial and error over time. Um, you know, the one thing I will say is that bad bacteria can start to grow. Like if your meat is over 41 degrees, 40, 40 right. degrees for a long period of time. But from what I've heard from a few food science experts is that it's way longer than you would ever imagine before that really starts to happen. I think there's like a lot of, um, I don't say scare tactics, but it's like you got to cook your chicken to 165, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, it, it, it's not as important as, again, just common sense, using your nose. Does it smell bad? Does it, is it starting to develop spots or something? That's a whole other right. thing. Generally, none of that's going to happen if you 
put it in the, fr- in the sink for four hours. Again, cold water, not warm water. Oh, or if you're in the fridge for a week, depending on how you're structuring it, um, use common sense, whatever you're comfortable with. But I've definitely pushed the limits. I could say it's for uh, science purposes, but really, I'm busy. And I'm, I'm lazy, and I don't want to get to them. And uh, so I a lot of times throw the word out there, dry aging, because I'm just lazy and I'm exhausted <laughs> taking those kids out, and I want to get to them. Yeah. Um, but I would say to throw out the opposite of dry aging, so wet aging uh, is when you would have that same goose breast or duck breast or pheasant breast, and you back sealed it in a bag and it's sitting in its own juices. Whereas dry aging, think of it as purely there's air hitting it and it's allowing itself to drain or evaporate those juices. It's not that you're going to have a dry duck breast or a dry pheasant breast. It's actually the opposite of that. If it's too wet, you go to sear it and it's going to steam, right? Okay. Rather, yep. like if you ever had a gray steak, if you ever cooked a gray steak yeah. instead of a nice brown crust, it's because it steamed itself. You've got too many steaks in there or it was too wet. It seems crazy to marinate your steak or your whatever it may be, you know, your duck breast, and you think all that juiciness is all flavor you put on the grill, but really you should almost pat it dry, you know? And then if you need to season it with a little dry rub, you can. If you need to baste it after that, after you've grilled it, then you can to add that flavor. But really, you know, unless it's a super hot flame, you know, it's going to dry it really quickly. Yeah. If you're going to put it in a cast iron pan or something, all that moisture is going to steam it. That makes sense. Guess, is it yeah. bad if you don't know any difference? But if you can right. get a nice crust on there to get that texture mouth feel, that's where it's like, oh man, this is the best duck I've had. Yeah. You did nothing different other than just patch your breasts dry. Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess that that makes sense. Yeah. 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 So, like, do you have do you have a preference between the wet age and the dry age? I've never done the wet age only because now I've got to get the vac sealer out. Yeah. I've got to uh, I got to do all that. Um, only to take it back out to then either freeze it or dry it or uh, freeze right. it or dry age it and then cook it or whatever. So no, I, I'm not opposed to it. It's just my preference is to use, again, the one that works best for me over time. Um, and it's more of that, just put it in the fridge. Again, if it's cold out in the garage, I'll, I shot some ducks. It would have been three weeks ago now, maybe. I bet you they sat out in the garage for a week. But it sounds like really cool temperatures here in Ohio. I had no, I had no concerns about yeah. it. And sure enough, I breast them out. It plucks better, too, when it's able to sit. Instead of trying to pluck a duck the day of, if you can let it go overnight, uh, everything just kind of firms up, and it's just much easier to pluck. Um, If you can take time, especially if you're the type of person who's scratching out a duck or not so much a geese, you're not going to pluck too many geese. But um, if you do pluck a goose, pick the smaller, younger birds, not the older, tougher ones. I've done that before. Um, But with ducks, even if you're just going to pluck the breast meat to make sure the skin and fat's on there, it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for you um, rather than just wrapping them in bacon or, you know, right. whatever the case may be. And I've got a really nice video on Midway USA. You go to my website, uh, wildgamecook.com. You go to recipes, you go to the Midway link, and there's a how to sear a duck breast video. And it's it's a long video. It's like 23 minutes, but it's very, very step detailed. Shows you every step so there's no confusion. And it's a really great way to eat duck. Again, it's very, very steaky. A lot of people wouldn't necessarily know it might be waterfowl if you didn't know any better. And I think that the the audience that would be listening to this would be interested in that because a lot of us will cook the breasts. You know, it's like you said, it's tedious work to to go through and uh, take different pieces of the bird and all that. I've been trying to be better at it myself. I've been, you know, saving the legs, like you said, and waiting until I have enough so that I can cook like a, you know, decent meal out of it. But, um, there's a lot of, you know, if you, if you see comments about cleaning birds, when people don't leave the fat, especially mallards, it's like a sin. So there's people that, you know, they don't know any better to, to pluck it, to clean it with the, the, the skin still on it. And then, render that fat that's under the skin you know none of that stuff really clicks with them when they're cleaning the birds they're just like i know that i have to pull these feathers off or i need to open this bird up and clean it and then if they had the background of like how to sear it with the information that you have that would get them in the mindset of keeping that skin on there and uh, seeing the difference in how they cook it for sure. And if you have a bird that's really shot up, I mean, you're not going through all that process, right? right? But if you just happen to know, you got a lucky death pellet, I call it, in the dome, and it's a beautifully shot bird, man, take the opportunity. Even if it's just one out of the five birds, six birds you got, or if your group, you know, got some birds, to take a really nice, beautifully shot bird and pluck the whole thing, 
one thing that does make it easier to cook, I've even been doing this with my Thanksgiving turkeys. You, know, you think of your Thanksgiving turkey, it's a big giant thing. Right. Uh, traditionally cooked, it's harder to cook to not make it dry, right? One way to make that turkey, or in this case, these duck breasts, uh, juicy without overcooking them is to spatchcock them, which basically just means take your game shears and cut that spine out of there and then smash that duck flat. I made some posts recently about that and it's amazing. It's it's literally finger licking good because a lot of people will say that like geese are greasy, right? And that comes from, I mean, the meat is incredibly lean. Yep. It's not like if you have just a boneless, skinless goose breast that that's going to be greasy. It's incredibly dry and lean if you don't, if you if you overcook it. Where that comes into play is if you were to leave the skin and or fat on that bird, the melting point of that fat is like, might as well be room temperature. So as soon as your hands start to touch it, it melts. So you feel greasy when you're messing with them. But really that, I mean, generally they're eating corn, right? So right. it's really good eating fat. Uh, I left some fat on some goose pastrami I recently made and it, it was really good. Um, so I'm going to try to like do a full on, full skin, full fat goose breast here soon. And turn that into pastrami and just see how that kind of turns out. Oh, yeah, to see the difference between it. Yeah, you can always rip it off. You can rip right. It and just yeah. meat if it doesn't work out, you know. But, um, and, you know, if you do keep the skin and fat on, it can help from getting freezer burn if you are going to put some back right. in the freezer. Oh, that makes sense, too. So for goose pastrami, that's kind of also a big thing is that, you know, when people, people kill a lot of geese, they either make pastrami with it or they make jerky with it. Do you have any insight onto how? Or I guess any tips on making the best goose pastrami? Um, so there's a recipe on MidwayUSA.com. Um, you know, go to my link and you'll find it. Um, it's tailored off of Hank Shaw's recipe. Meat, Meat Eater has another very popular recipe. Um, you know, again, it's step by step. The getting that pink curing salt right so that you don't use too much um, is key because uh, it can be it can be overly salty uh, depending on how you do it. Okay. Um, I put the cure on, and then I just make sure the cure is actually just the kosher salt, the pink salt, all of it together goes on the breast. I make sure after it's cured for almost two days that I really wash it well under the sink to get as much of that salt off as possible because it's definitely penetrated the goose and done what it's needed to do. Um, I think that process right there, cleaning it off as good as you possibly can and putting it back in the fridge, again, to dry and get a little tacky, uh, I think they call it a pedicule or something, to develop that little bit of skin um, it's going to allow that smoke to really adhere to it. And uh, if you haven't made goose pastrami, it's definitely something worthwhile. It's a tedious process, um, but it is really good. I took some to SHOT Show last week, and, you know, I'm giving out little party favors. And yeah. I'm not going to say I lined up some partnerships because of the <laughs> goose pastrami, but it sure didn't didn't hurt anything. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I, got to, it's, I feel like goose pastrami is kind of in the same tier as, like, Jerky, snack sticks, you know, you're kind of your traditional, um, I guess, processed ways of cooking. They're making these, using the meat. And uh, I personally don't do it too much. I'd like to do it more. But a lot of the people that I know, when they, if they kill a bunch of geese and they don't have any use for it, there's people that take it from them specifically to make the goose pastrami. Yeah, because you can fill your smoker up. You know, like I'm not right. doing it for two breasts. I'm doing it when I've got eight, ten breasts, and I'm filling up the smoker. And you can freeze them individually, right? Um, and they make great landowner gifts, like for the people who let you hunt, yeah. you know? You got to be cautious because you don't want them to chunk into or bite into a, a shot, yeah. you know? Um, again, pick and choose the breasts that you think are the best ones. Not that, not that something can't sneak in there, but take them in the blind, taking them to the holidays, um, it's a great way to introduce someone new to wild game. Um, because if, it, if done right, it tastes really well. And I say done right, my process really, it's like a three to four day process to make it, but really mine's like eight to 10 because I'm, I'm setting them in water to letting them purge out as much of that blood and myoglobin in there uh, as possible. And then, uh, then going through that process. And I think you just end up with them get more steakier, cleaner tasting goose. Yeah. Um, uh, cause Goose definitely has a flavor to it. I'm not going to call it gamey. It's just what goose tastes like. Right. Uh, you know, deer's not gamey. It's just what deer tastes like. You know, just like grain-fed beef versus corn-fed beef, or uh, grass-fed versus corn-fed. They taste different. Some people can't stand grass-fed beef. They would never call grass-fed beef gamey. They'd call it grass-fed beef. Right. It's just what it tastes like. So Yeah, that's always hard to explain to people that goose, duck, squirrel, rabbit, turkey, deer— 
it doesn't have a gamey taste that's the taste of it. Now, you can have an off taste uh, because of the way it was prepped or therefore lack of prep from the field to the table. You can have an off taste. Um, you would have that same off taste if beef was handled bad. Now, of course, there's standards for all that, so you don't you don't really right. taste in that. Um, but it was funny. I gave I took some goose pastrami to a wrestling meet uh, recently. I asked one of the coaches if they want some. They said, sure, I love liver, you know. I'm like, it's not going to taste like liver. Yeah. I'm like, it's going to be really good. And they kind of looked at me like, this is this isn't goose. I'm like, it's goose. You know? <laughs> but their experience has always been this really overcooked, you know, product, which generally gets more irony because of their, the way their meat is, you know, it's, it's dark meat because they migrate. And, you know, it's just, uh, you got, it's not a quail, right? It's not a rough grouse. Like those birds taste amazing. Uh, when you start getting into waterfowl, um, it just takes a little time and attention. You know, you can't just, uh, I call it right out of the box. Goose, right out of the box, isn't really good. You got to do some work to it. Yeah. No, and I think that explaining the process of how you're you're processing your game, you know, it gives people an idea of, you know, ways that they can make their meat taste better by taking the proper precautions as soon as it comes out of the field. So it's really good to have that information. Yeah, especially in September. Let's say you're, you're in an early season in September and it's 75 degrees out, maybe hotter, maybe 90. If you don't take care of those geese really quickly, you're really behind the eight ball. And I'm not saying the geese is ruined because it's definitely not. You need to do what you need to do to get in the freezer. But if it does get warm and it took you a minute to get to it, you may need to do some sort of marinade, you know, some sort of Asian potent marinade. A lot of people right. bring up these different types of very pungent brisket marinades. I don't know if all that's necessary because some of that stuff really will just penetrate into there and you can't taste the goose at all. Um, but yeah, like antelope's the same way. Sometimes antelope gets a bad rap. Well, it's because you're killing them in September and it's warm out. Like you've got to right. get in there, clean those cavities out of those geese. Even if you can't process them, when you get to the truck, open them up towards the bottom into your breastplate and just get all those um, guts out of there. Maybe even go as far if you have plenty on hand. Make sure you water your dogs first. But if you got extra water, pour some water down into that cavity to help start to cool it off. I've done that. Yeah, it makes sense. A time or two when it's really warm because birds, you know, they they self-regulate their heat, especially like turkeys. If you've ever killed a spring turkey, the moment it's dead, it, it can't regulate its temperature anymore. So it gets really, really hot. Um, if it's a warmer day, it's going to be a while before you can get home and, and process it. Open that cavity up and get those guts out and allow that bird to start to cool down. Uh, is is so simple to do, and it, it, you may have to sacrifice the heart and the liver because you may not be able to put it in anything to keep it. Uh, but it's better to sacrifice the heart and liver than to sacrifice those uh, breasts and the legs. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I I think that the the ice in the cavity is more known in the deer world, but I don't think that a lot of people would carry that over to small game. You know why? Because they don't value small game as much as they do deer, right? That's fair. A lot of people don't even value deer as much as they value beef and chicken at their house, but they will go as far as to, to do their best to take care of it because deer hunting is expensive, let's say, right? Yeah. Everything you've got best is in it. A lot of people just consciously or even subconsciously go, it's just a goose. Right. You know, it's just a duck. It's just a pheasant. It's a game bird. It's a, it's a game preserved bird, right? Yeah. It's not even a wild bird. It's just a game preserved bird. Well, that's still good meat. It's arguably better eating meat, maybe than a wild bird, you know? Um, so take time to take care of it. Um, and the other thing too, that helps me out in regards to getting those legs and things that nature, when we talk about being more tedious, you know, I have two full grown teenagers now. So like, Hey, get your yeah. knife out and I'm going to do this step and this step. I need you to do this step and I need you to finish it by getting the hearts and livers, you know? And so we did that this year. Um, and you know, I'm getting them involved because it's tedious, whether yeah. it's cleaning fish, like, Hey, I'll, we can keep fish if you guys help me clean them, but I'm not cleaning a whole basket full of bluegills or <laughs> same way with everything else. You want to go squirrel hunt or whatever? Okay, fine. You're going to help me clean them, you know? Yeah. No, that totally makes sense. Okay. So I wanted to get into the, the deer processing side, kind of switching from that, the small game and making a little bit of transition there with the, the ice in the chest there. Um, so when you're processing deer, do you have like a step-by-step -step process that you have that you found that works the best for you? For sure. And uh, I guess for a little background, so I've been doing my own deer processing since like the 2012 season. And that 2012 season, I shot a little fawn. Um, is 105 pounds dressed. I'll never forget it. And I take it to the processor. And it was a long season that year, but she was in the wrong place, wrong timing. <laughs> and uh, 
I ended up paying like 140 bucks, uh, which is your standard processing fee for ground and steaks and roasts. And um, I got about 37 pounds of meat back. You know, you, you do the cost analysis. It's not all that bad, right? But right. it's still 140 bucks. And you go to kill two deer, that's $280. Right. And young, young family, young marriage. And um, I shoot another deer later that week. And I'm pretty confident it was a button buck. And I'm pretty confident it was the pair that had been going around the farm. And so <laughs> I shot this deer. It's arguably the same size. And I remember it was about, again, 105 pounds dress. And my buddy's like, why don't we just start hacking it up? We could totally do it. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? We totally could. So he went and got every Tupperware bully possibly could imagine, <laughs> got some knives, and we just started hacking. We figured whatever we messed up, we could put it in the ground pile. But we're going to get, we may mess up some things, but we may get some things that they're not going to take time to do. And uh, to go from that to now where I am now, I've definitely learned a lot. I mean, I've processed a lot of deer. Each of the last four years, my boys have killed four or five deer. And I do some for my cousins and my uncles. So, I've learned a lot. Tr try to get more efficient. And the one thing that a lot of that hangs up a lot of people who self process their deer is the silver skin and the membrane right. and all that stuff. And they spend copious hours just messing with it. And depending on the application, it really doesn't matter. For most of your ground meat, generally, it doesn't matter. Uh, where it really only matters is for your steaks, you know, your back strap and so on. If you're going to use a roast for a crock pot recipe, an instant pot recipe, low and slow, all that stuff is going to melt away to nothing, whether you believe it or not, it totally will. Um, and so you, you can save hours uh, and frustration. You can save frustration by not messing with any of that. But generally, uh, what I do, if, if all things are equal and the weather is nice, I'm going to hang my deer uh, at my house, and I generally hang it from the feet, uh, the back feet, head facing down. Um, I'll skin it as quickly as I can. Um, that may be a couple hours. It may be however long, but I try to skin it. And skinning for me is the worst part. That's the least part I'm I'm good at. Um, it's just frustrating. I'm not I'm not the best <laughs> knife skill person. Yeah. Um, but I've learned that I prefer it to be skin off rather than let it hang for a week with the skin on. Again, if it's brutally cold, the skin on isn't so much gonna ruin any of the meat. But if it is marginally warm, even in the even if you killed in the 30s and 40s, um, and you leave that hide on, it's gonna take that much longer for that deer to cool down. Right. So um, that's where you see the ice and the cavities and things of that nature. But outside of that, what I like from skinning it is it does develop a little bit of a skin, that pellicle kind of a thing. And some people don't like that, um, cause they think they're wasting meat. Well, really you're, if you're trimming the silver skin and everything off anyways, you're, you're, you're going to trim that outer layer. What I found right. is, is that outer skin allows you to then pull the muscles apart and that skin, you know, comes off and yeah. really there's less knife work. So I prefer to skin it. Uh, if the weather is cooperating, I'm going to leave it hang for at least a day, if not two. You get into like that fourth, fifth day. I, I may even like try to cover up the shanks and stuff with uh, saran wrap because they can get really dry, okay. um, dehydrated. Not that they won't rehydrate in a crock pot. They would. Um, just for the simple fact that I'm trying to preserve the quality of the meat. You know, I may wrap right. them in saran wrap after like say three days. Um, and then I'll start to break it down. I generally set up my table and then I have a bunch of LEM meat lugs, um, just plastic meat containers that I'll put the hind quarters in, the front quarters in, and then I'll put one with the prime cuts. So the back straps, the tenderloins, um, things like that. And I've got one that's just trimmed. So from the brisket, from the neck meat, whatever, all that's going to go into where I'm going to grind it all up. Um, the neck meat is good for low and slow, but in our house, we use so much ground meat. The neck generally gets ground up. Um, but I'll put it into all those containers. LEM makes a drain tray to put the bottom of those. And okay. just like we mentioned earlier in the podcast with draining the fluids out of those meats, anyone who's ever processed their own deer knows how much blood or myoglobin water can drain out of that. Right. There is a lot of nasty, not nasty flavor, but the flavors you don't like, that's where it is. That's where it lies. And so again, Assuming weather is all equal, I'll put it in the garage. If it's too cold outside, I'll put it in the garage. If it's not cold enough, I do I do have the luxury of having an extra refrigerator in the garage that I can clear out shelves and I can put those meat lugs in there to keep it cold. Okay. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not in any hurry to put it in the freezer. I want it to work its rigor mortis. You know, there's science that shows it's got to be hung for this many days for rigor mortis to do its effect. I don't know how to articulate all that. But I would say if the weather allows you to and your meat is going to stay under 41 degrees, 
generally in that 34 to 38 range, um, the meat temperature, not so much the ambient temperature, you know, cause you got to watch it may be warm outside, but if you've got it in the shade, you're fine. Or maybe cold outside, but it's getting direct sunlight yeah. and it actually warms it up. So just be cautious of that. Uh, generally, I think you've probably got a longer leash than you imagine you have. Um, and so I've just found that if you just take your time and, you know, cause once you break it down off the deer, that's where you really need a lot of the rigor mortis and stuff to do its work as well. It's still connected. If you can't, that's fine. Um, but then put it in the fridge, let it drain. And then I, I just vac seal everything. I'm going to vac seal. I do uh, my ground meat in the little round bags. I prefer that method because I can go straight from the grinder right into the freezer. Yep. Uh, we mix our ground meat with 20% beef fat or pork fat, whatever I can get my hands on. I get that from a local grocer. Charges me a dollar a pound. You know, that's some good value. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I talk to them throughout the year. I may take them a little roll of summer sausage. Like, hey, here you go. This is what I made with what you gave me, you know. Yeah. And uh, okay. it just keeps them happy so that they call me when, um, you know, uh, you know, they've got other hunters calling them for the deer meat that time of year, right? Don't call them gun week. Yeah. Try to get a hold of them a few weeks early, you know? No, that's that's a good point because, uh, you know, you, there is also a debate when it comes to adding fat into your, your meat. Which one, pork or beef fat, is better? Do you have a preference? So funny enough, I had kind of a, what I assume was a bad experience with beef fat years ago. And I just like, you know, I'm never using beef fat again. And so I switched to pork fat and never had an issue with it. But whenever quarantine hit or whatever, all that COVID stuff, for whatever reason, it was really tough to get pork fat. Okay. And so I could get my hands on beef fat and I started using it again. I'm like, oh my gosh, where's this been all my life? You know, it was just really good. Yeah. You would expect beef fat to be. Um, and there's a couple other things that doesn't really bother me, but you know, I guess with pork, you know, there's a certain minimum temperature you got to get it to, whereas beef there isn't. Well, theoretically, pork fat is pork because I don't mix it with pork meat. I just, I just try to get right. clean fat if I can. But if you're cooking a deer burger and you want your burger medium, you know, or medium rare, theoretically, you may want to be cautious about that with pork fat. I never really thought about it until it was brought to my attention. I mean, again, I'm still sitting here. Yeah. Of you. I didn't <laughs> die. You know? But um, but generally so, you don't have to worry about that with, with beef fat. Um, now, if I am making sausages, brats, Italian sausage, things of that nature, I try to use pork fat. Okay. Breakfast sausage, I'm trying to use pork fat, which is a little bit more traditional, right? You, you know, but snack sticks, ground meat, um, summer sausage, I, will, I won't hesitate to use either, but I probably now prefer beef fat. Okay. Yeah, it's always interesting to hear, you know, there's, it It doesn't seem to be regional necessarily, but just kind of maybe what what's more available that people are like, I like pork fat better, I like the beef fat better. You know, it's, it's just interesting uh, to hear who, what preference is and why? I do believe that there is a strong correlation amongst a lot of things in the outdoors that I do this because my dad did it or my granddad did That's it. True. There's a lot of that. Yeah. And um, that it's wrong, but it's like open your mind up to some other possibilities, you know, because yeah. you, you, you surprise. I really had ridden off beef fat. Like, okay, sure, I'll take it because that's the only option I got. It was mouthwatering. You know, again, I... I've been cooking my snack sticks on the smoker with no casing just because you get that flavor bomb right on your tongue without the, the casing getting in the way. Okay. Uh, it, it'd be great the other way. But when it's that way and you're taking it off the grill, you got to do your taste testing to make sure it's done, right? So you're right. eating it and you're just in heaven. You're like, oh my gosh, this is so good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of stigmas. I shouldn't say stigma is probably the right word. It's just traditions. Yes. I use pork shoulder because my dad uses pork shoulder. I mix it with 50% beef. If I'm mixing it with 50% beef, you know, beef is six ninety nine, eight ninety nine a pound. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I'm getting 40 pounds of it. Do the math. Like, right. my free deer just from free to, you know, a lot more. Oh, yeah. And I, yeah. Um, I try to justify the meat as being free also. Uh, and I do that. I tell my wife this. But, like, I can go golfing and I can spend $40 to do 18, you know, uh, 18 in a cart. Yeah. And I'll leave it there with nothing but a bad attitude and a couple of... <laughs> You know, <laughs> yeah. um, if I buy a deer tag and I buy ammo and so on, that's my golf. That's my hobby is going out and right. sitting in the woods is my 18 rounds. But I have a chance to leave with, you know, 80 pounds of meat or whatever. Right. And so to me, that's how I justify the meat as being free is the hobby is the hobby, right? The right. hobby costs money. And I'm going to, that's a sunk cost, just like yeah. golf is. You know, I can buy new golf clubs. I can buy all this. That's, I don't 
I've played a lot of golf, you know, yeah. you know, it's expensive. It, it so it's, I, you know, and, um, it, and you start adding costs cause I'm, I'm happy to spend, you know, 20 to $40 on pork fat or beef fat every year at, at right. the, and of course seasonings, you know, LEM seasonings or whatever you're using for your summer sausage and brats and things of that nature. But it's pennies on the dollar compared to what you're doing when you're going to the store to buy it. Of course. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a way to kind of pad the cost of the meat that you're already going to eat. You don't get a ton right. if you're if you if you were to rely on just ducks, you're not going to get a whole lot out of that. But within your family, if you can shoot theoretically six deer in Ohio, and your three kids can shoot six deer in Ohio, you could be eating a lot of deer all year. And without a no. possession limit, then it's way easier. Sure. So I would say this: like I have a I have a growing family of five. I say growing. My boys are really growing. They're they're in middle school and high school. We kill four to five deer a year, and I generally try to ration it to make sure that I do have some. Like I know I'm never out, right? Right. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, five deer, maybe a sixth one, because we are shooting does, mind you. It's not like we're shooting three big red right. bucks, right? Which you're getting eighty to a hundred pounds of meat from each. We're getting mostly does, which are thirty to fifty pounds of meat. So we're right. we're generally putting back about two hundred and fifty pounds of product, um, and we do buy chicken. Uh, that's like our second protein. And then the third protein would be a, a mixture of the waterfowl and upland birds, things like that. We buy yeah. pork a little bit, but it's down further down the list. I will say some people, and you know who they are, they can kill a lot of geese. They could fill a freezer <laughs> with goose breasts if they wanted. I've been lucky enough to be friends with some of those people. And yeah. that's how I've got these goose breasts to experiment with yeah. and, and try different things. But it's very hearty. I mean, there's a lot of meat on a goose. There is. And, um, you know, it, yeah, it's it's uh, it's good. Yeah, that's why I've, you know, in the past couple of years, I've felt bad with like just breasting them out, especially it, it, really all the birds, but like teal, not so much. It's like you're not going to get like a big leg, bit bit of leg meat off of a teal, but you could cook the teal whole. Correct. And so it's like, a lot more tedious to progress it, but it is, that's a worthwhile bird, as you know, to do it with. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it's extra work. No question. It's just a matter of, one, how much do you value it? Because right. there's like at, there's legal, right? There's legal, there's ethical, there's sporting. There's nothing illegal about not keeping the legs. Right. Um, but, you know, you only have so much time. You know, this duck is a bonus bird rather than something I'm using as sustenance. Right. Again, I'm definitely using ducks and geese not as sustenance. It's more of a bonus. Ooh, look what we're having tonight. Right. Uh, um, you know, but if you do go through those processes and you do find a good, easy recipe to do, you will be like, you know what? I'm not going to keep all my legs from now on, but hey, this particular day, if they're not shot up real bad, let's go ahead and keep all the legs. I've got this new recipe I'm going to try out. You yeah, know? or if you've got the extra time that you can dedicate to cleaning, I'm like, for me, any... right? Yeah. Well, in my case, my kids don't help me so much clean them, but like right. if they're down for a nap and I have an hour and a half, then it's like I can go out there and kind of really spend my time cleaning them up and, you know, getting everything situated the way I'd like to instead of like rushing home, being like, I got to get inside and help. I, you know, generally I just throw the birds and not throw them, but I set them in my barn. And uh, like you said, they'll sit there for a few days. And then when I have a good day that I can get out there and like actually clean them the way that I want to clean them, then I can start my process, which I've learned a lot today. So I can kind of elaborate on that a little bit, but it's a, it's a good conversation to have because I don't think that there's a lot of information out there you know, that dives into it real deep. There's, you know, Meat Eater and there's some other bigger names that people get information from, but they also, they, they'll they give you the process, but they've strayed from the process because they've done that so long ago. So it's easy to, like, get lost in what they've already put out that could be six years old. It's not that the process has changed at all, but it's just more difficult to find that information. Right. So that's the beauty of my recipes. Um, generally, so if I don't have something that you're looking for, just write me, you know, get a hold of me on my website, get a hold of me through socials. I'll be happy to answer questions. And if I don't know the answer, I'll get you in touch with who does have that answer. Um, but yeah, um, I forget what else I was going to say there. Oh, in regards to goose breast, just a, a really quick tip. So on the back side of that goose breast, where it attaches to the carcass, basically at the wing joint, um, there's a really thick piece of like cartilage membranes silver skin um just a pro tip is i go in there and i kind of bevel that out of there i kind of create a little v 
Okay. Just notch that out of there because it's really inedible if you're doing a quick grill, you know, hot and fast type of a setting. Okay. If you're going to do low and slow, it would, it would melt away. But in a, in a setting like deer jerky, um, smoked goose, goose pastrami, things of that nature. Um, and you see that on my videos on Midway, just chop that out of there, trying to okay. minimize the meat loss. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just one, one less thing, especially if you're, you're treating someone else to it. Yeah. You give them that chunk, they're sitting there gnawing on it. Um, and then this year I did go and I got a, uh, little pinpoint metal detector. It's not foolproof, but it does pick up, you know, uh, unlike a magnet, which would only pick up non-lead. Right. Um, of course, with water power, not using lead, but with upland birds, squirrels, et cetera, you can wave this little pinpoint metal detector over it. And I've had a lot of success finding not every shot, but say 70, 80% of the shot that are in these goose breasts, especially if I slice it. Yeah. And then I'm moving that pinpoint around because, you know, goose breasts are pretty dense, but, you know, it's better to get most of them and try to save yourself a dentist bill. You know, <laughs> so that's a little pro tip too. Yeah. I've, I've bought this, like, it's a little wand, uh, metal detector that you can kind of just wave over the, and I've found pretty much everything that I've sh that's entered the goose breast. Like it makes it a lot easier to find those pellets and get them out of there instead of, uh, finding them with your teeth. Like you said. So for sure. Do you have a, uh, a number one wild game recipe? I do. I mean, that, that's a that's a that's a lot of answers that can be <laughs> with that um, because there's just it, it even get different species. But I generally try to keep it pretty simple. Um, you know, a good reverse seared backstrap is as good as anything. But something that's a little bit different, um, and I believe I have both of these recipes on my website. One is smothered venison, which is basically a cubed venison steak that's been dredged and kind of fried like country fried steak, if you will. And it's got a brown gravy with mushrooms, onions, garlic, um, and just smothered over the top. And the other one is a stroganoff recipe that uh, my in-laws used to make a lot during Lent, which is coming up here soon. Uh, so you can't have meat during Lent on, you know, Fridays and this and that. And so it's uh, a spetzel base. So like a spetzel is a German dumpling. Mm -hmm. And then it's your thinly sliced venison steak. Um, and then it's basically sour cream and paprika and some mushrooms. And it, it's a stroganoff, um, and that's on Midway USA as well. Really simple ingredients. Uh, it's super easy to make, and it just kind of takes me back, I guess, to a time when I was dating my wife and, and so on. But it's a great meal to eat, and then it's even better, arguably, as leftovers. That's awesome. I really do enjoy stroganoff, so I'm definitely going to have to check that one out. Yep. So I like to ask the guests to kind of finish off the podcast. If you had one hobby that you could take on, that you had all the time in the world, all the money that you needed for it, what would be that one hobby? Now, it could, it's just something that I'm not currently doing? Correct. That's a good question, because uh, a lot of the hobbies I do like, I'm currently doing it <laughs> some in smaller capacities, but... Um, if you have one that you'd want to do in your know, capacity, then yeah. Well, I mean, cooking like a food truck would be super cool. I'd like to have my own food truck. And That'd be sweet. That. But um, a little bit off brand is I cut my kids' hair. So oh, okay. um, I, I learned how to cut. Really, it was, a, again, a process of saving money as as uh, young kids. I just gave them a good old boy's cut, you know, the little right. crew cut. Yep. But now that the hairstyles are getting longer and a little different, I just watched a lot of Instagram videos and such, and I've taught myself how to cut hair. And so I wouldn't. I wouldn't call it a hobby, but I could easily enjoy cutting people's hair and BSing with them in the barber shop for sure. Yeah, that would be super cool. Yeah. Yeah, the one that I've always gone back to is uh, classic cars. I'm like super into watching racing and stuff like that and cars, but I just haven't pulled the trigger on like buying one. So that's always been something that I'm like, you know, if it was, if I had more time and I had more disposable income, that's probably something I would get into. Yeah, no, I think I'm satisfied pretty good with the hunting and fishing. I'd like to do more of it, right? Yeah. Uh, like different styles of it. But yeah, generally speaking, between hunting and fishing and then following my kids, you know what You know what the answer would be? I, I take back the barbershop thing. If I could coach uh, my kids' sports and or just sports in general, if I could, if I could coach, whether that be baseball, football, um, those two specifically, I, I would I would do it in a heartbeat. Really? Um, I cool. love to coach. It's just I don't have, 
I don't yeah. have the time for because technically I do have the time to cut hair right now, at least with my <laughs> family and a couple of uh, friends and stuff. But yeah, coaching would be the number one answer for sure. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, John, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if you guys are looking for any wild game cooking information, check out John's website, wildgamecook.com. All that stuff will be linked in the description. And uh, we just are really, I really appreciate your time coming on here. I know you're a busy guy. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. I, I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, does anyone reach out to me if you got any questions whatsoever? All right. Thanks, John. See you guys.